Good morning. And a couple of announcements. Um, some of you already know, but uh, if you haven't, uh, the, the, the God Shaped Brain, the new book, came out a few weeks ago. InterVarsity Press has made a little companion study guide. And we, uh, as a ministry, have printed some of these up here for locally. If you want to take some, share with people who have the book. And, uh, and if you, you would like that and you're not living locally, then online, either at our website or InterVarsity Press, they have it in an Adobe file that's free for download. So you can just download it and get your own that way. Also, our new um, Bible study, first of our series in the Truth, Love, and Freedom Bible Study Guides. These are like uh, quarterlies. They're in 13 lessons a day for each week of the, of the lesson, but they're not dated, so you can start them anytime. And uh, they're out there, and if you have a Bible study group that meets uh, once a week and want uh, some material, well, this is the first one. It's on domestic violence in our church, a 13-week Bible study guide. And if you have a group of 10 people, then take 10 of them so you can have, each one can have one. And uh, we want to thank Johnny. Johnny is here today. She's the principal contributor uh, to this uh, particular guide, and we have some more in the pipeline that will be coming along soon. If you live outside the area and you would like this, on our website is the Adobe file. So if you live, for instance, in Australia or New Zealand or South Africa and you'd like this, the Adobe file is there, the printable version. You can download it at no cost. We've uh, given you the freedom to print these up in your local area as long as you're going to use them for not-for-profit basis. And you can print your own and have your own locally or just use it as an Adobe file. So I want to make sure that everybody knew about those. Let's go ahead and begin with prayer this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study. We thank you for the love you've given us. We thank you as you have drawn us closer to you with the truth as revealed in Jesus. We pray that you'll be with us today, that our minds will be drawn to you, and that we will understand your methods, and we will live to, to bring glory to your name. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. We are doing lesson uh, number 11 in the quarterly, um, Major Lessons for Minor Prophets, and the title this week is Visions of Hope, Zechariah. And the key thought then says the following. It says, Though Israel had been punished for its sins, it was time for its people to live again in relationship with God according to his promises. What do you think about this idea? Think about it for a minute. Just think about what it's actually saying. Any concerns? When, you know, the, the marriage relationship is, is used throughout Scripture as a metaphor for God's relationship with his people, is it not? So let's use that med metaphor and take this key thought and apply it to a husband and wife. Though Susie had been punished for her transgressing her husband's rules, it was time for her to live again in relationship with her husband according to his promise not to beat her anymore. Do you like that? Well, it depends on what you think of when you think of punishment. As a parent, I think of punishment maybe as discipline. You know, it, it, the child's going to feel like it's punishment because it is painful or takes something away that they really like or whatever. But, you know, I'm viewing it as a disciplinary action, and I think some of the things we interpret as punishment from God could be disciplined by God. I like the way your, your mind is going at that, but they chose the word punishment. They didn't choose the word discipline, did they? Punishment comes from the word punitive. It means to exact vengeance upon. Discipline comes from the word disciple. It means to teach. So as a parent, you disciple or discipline your children. Absolutely. God disciplines those he loves. The Bible says, it doesn't say that God punishes those he loves. It says he disciplines those he loves. So you're right. Discipline is an expression of love to help set right, to help teach, to help, to help bring back to God's methods. Absolutely. Punishment, though, is an exaction of vengeance. To, to, to inflict harm upon, to make someone pay for. <clears throat> hmm. Yeah. Yes? Um, the statement also would imply that the punishment was the lack of the relationship. Um, when in fact, you know, they're moving away from the relationship is why God couldn't protect them. Yeah. Um, Ideas, it's attributing to idea, the idea, at least it sounds to me, and if, I, if I'm misunderstanding, please can tell me, no, I don't, I don't hear it that way, but it sounds to me almost as if they're suggesting God is the one who punished them. That's how it sounds. And that's why I use the metaphor of a husband-wife relationship. If, if uh, and Susie's husband beats her to punish her for breaking his rules, what happens to her ability to love him in that relationship? Yeah, there's a problem with that, isn't there? Yes. It's not so much what is said, as well as what is not said or left out. If it would explain that it is for agitation, for, for uh, teaching and so forth, then you would understand how they use the word punishment. 
Yes, but again, I think, I think the word is selected because I do believe they mean punishment. That's right. They don't mean discipline. That's right. They were being punished. Um, and, and ideas such as this attributed to God are evidence how deeply into the psyche of Christianity um, God's methods have been twisted. This, this lie has penetrated. Um, remember the disciples had spent three and a half years with Christ. At the end of three and a half years with Christ, they still didn't understand his mission. Peter was still arguing with them the night before. No, no, not you. And he's a get thee behind me, Satan. So just because we have misunderstandings in our psyche don't, doesn't mean we're actually opposed to God in our heart. Peter and the disciples were for God. They were for Christ, but they had misunderstanding that needed to be cleared up. Um, the question is, do we have a heart that loves truth and loves to grow in the knowledge of God and we understand that truth is unfolding and so we're constantly reassessing with new light, with new perspective, we're searching, we're studying. We're being, or do we have this idea that we've got the truth and now our truth is the only version of truth and we're going to make sure that you believe our version of truth unless, in other words, the Pharisees in Christ's day. Do you see a difference between them and the, and the apostles? The apostles had lots of misunderstanding. But they were teachable. They were willing to grow. They were willing to investigate. They were willing to examine their ideas in light of further evidence and truth. And they advanced in that. And then they ultimately were transformed by the truth. The truth will set you free. The Pharisees, though, in Christ's day, couldn't be taught because they were the bastions of truth. And they had to defend against all new ideas. And thus they picked stones up on multiple occasions to stone Christ when he tried to present light to them. And so you can see this today. Don't be discouraged if you've held some ideas that have later been discovered to not be exactly right. I have too. I have grown a lot in my knowledge of God over the, the decades. So just because one has a distorted idea doesn't mean they're an enemy of God is what I'm trying to say. So would a wife ever give genuine love and trust to a husband who beats her for not following his rules? No. no. So can we love, trust, and grow in the fullness of our individuality in a relationship dominated by threat, coercion, and imposed punishments? Can we grow to the fullness of what God wants us to be if that relationship is, is, is coercive in nature? So the idea that punishment for sin is inflicted by God is a lie. How can we then restate our metaphor of the marriage relationship that more accurately represents Israel's condition in, in this setting in, in the Old Testament? Though Susie, yeah, though Susie, because of her repeated infidelity, had suffered the pain and distress of living alienated from her husband, her husband continued to love her, and now it was time for Susie to live again in relationship with him according to his promised devotion to her. Does that sound different? Yeah, this is what happened to Israel. They were completely, they were in apostasy, they were in rebellion, they were going after false gods, and, and what happened? He set them free. He said, if you don't want to be in relationship with me, if you don't want to be loyal and devoted to me, if your heart is not with me, despite all the efforts I've done to try to win your love to me, then I, then, then I set you free. You're free to go after your other, other gods and live in the world and in the circumstances that that will bring upon you. And what did it bring? It brought pain and suffering. And in that pain and suffering, they eventually came to a point where they wanted God back. They wanted God back. It's like the prodigal son. Dad set him free. He went out and lived wild. Thought he was having fun for a while. Then it ended up with the pig slop, eating pig food. And then he said, wow, it was better at home. They don't go home. There was suffering. There was punishment, if you want to use it, in the, if you want to use that word, as a direct consequence brought out from the behavior itself. Not an infliction from God because he was hurt and he was upset and his feelings were offended. So why did Israel end up in cap captivity? Because God used his power to make sure that it happened or because God removed his protective hedge and allowed them to reap what they chose? Yeah. First paragraph, it says, On the wall of an old castle in Central Europe, a short Latin inscription reads, Dum sparo spiro. It means, as long as I breathe, I have hope. This saying can summarize the message of Zechariah to God's people. Nearly 20 years after their return from Babylon, Babylonian captivity, some began to wonder if God was still present among his people. They started to feel discouragement re uh, replace their earlier enthusiasm. 
Well, in the 19th century, there was a great spiritual awakening in, in North America, with many people returning to relation with God, taking seriously Jesus' promise to come again. Many Christian groups began longing for and looking toward the advent, the return of Christ. Some set dates only to be disappointed, to set dates to be disappointed again. Several new church groups arose from this passion to see Jesus come again. The Seventh-day Adventists, those who want to see the advent of the Messiah, church was one of these. May 21, 2013, just a few weeks ago, celebrated the 150th anniversary of the founding of the SDA church. Uh, May 21, 1863 was the date that was voted to actually become an official church organization. The church with its uh, mission was to prepare and send a message that Jesus is coming again and prepare the world for the advent. Question. 150 years later, do Christians today still have a passionate expectation that Jesus will return soon? Or have we lost hope? Fallen asleep? Fallen into complacency? And believe Jesus will come one day, but not in our day? Any thoughts? Are you passionate? Do you, do you believe? Let, let me, let me, here's two questions. What do you think of these two questions? They almost are alike, but listen carefully. Do you believe Jesus will come soon? Do you believe Jesus can come soon? Are those the same question? No, they're different. What do you believe? See, do you believe Jesus will come soon implies that God has a set timetable. Jesus' return is pre-programmed. It's like a time bomb. The clock has been set. It's been turned on. It's counting down. And when it reaches zero, he's coming. Do you believe Jesus can come soon implies that God is waiting for certain conditions to occur before Christ comes. While God knows the day and the hour Christ returns because God, because God knows the future, what determines the time is not some preset clock, but the condition of certain things on earth which we can influence. Yes to the first note. So, 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 so which do you think is more accurate? There's a preset clock and it's counting down? No. no. Or that God knows the day and the hour, but that's determined by conditions. <coughs> yes. So what do you believe? Do you believe God can come, Christ can come soon? Yes. yes. So what's stopping him? What's the conditions that aren't being met that he's waiting for, as you understand it? And I'd like to hear some answers. What do you believe the conditions are? Okay. Uh, did you all hear what Lori said? The gospel of the kingdom hasn't been preached to the entire world. What, are you telling me that in every nation, tribe, and people around the world, people haven't heard the name Jesus Christ yet? The true gospel. Oh, okay. The true gospel. Okay, what would, what would distinguish the true gospel from another? God versus a hating God that's going to destroy you. Okay, a God of love versus a hateful, punishing God. See, which, which version has gone to the world? Well, that's gone. Jesus died to, to take upon himself our sin, to assuage the wrath of the Father because he loved us so much. This has gone to the world, right? The yeah. Inquisition has gone to the world. The Inquisition has gone to the world, yes. What I was thinking was the, uh, the disciples were confused and arguing amongst themselves just, uh, just weeks before Christ was crucified. I think the gospel has to go to the church, God's church, because God's church doesn't understand the gospel. They don't understand, you know, the love concept that you're uh, explaining to us over the past few weeks and the past few years. I, I, would, I would have to second that. I would have to agree with that. Yes, Ken. I think the idea with power lessons and, and also with the effort that a lot of people make to reach other people, that they are trying to get to the point where they think the other people are. In other words, if I think you are a person who holds fast the idea that well, the concept that God is a vengeful, punishing God, then I have to center all my <coughs> introduction around that to you. But I, I think what's happened with that whole thing is that we, that's a trap. That's, that's, a, that's just quicksand. Because if you step into that, 
into that uh, terminology or that language to try to reach someone, you're just going to get pulled down with it. Yeah, I, I don't know that they're stepping in to try to reach them. I think they believe it. I think there's a big difference. I, I, I see what you're saying. You can step down to use language because you're talking to a five-year-old and you say, you know, just, Johnny, you've got to brush your teeth. Why? Because of the second law of thermodynamics, and if you don't, they're going to decay. Huh? Okay, because I've got a rule, and if you don't, you're going to get spanked. I, I, I oh, think okay. It's condescension from the editors as well. I really Perhaps. Because they, I mean, if they believe all this stuff about God is love, then why are they going to make God a God of hate? Because the, the reason they do is because they hold to a distorted law concept. They actually believe God imposes law. He's the sovereign. He has sovereignty. It's his right to establish laws, and those laws must be obeyed. And if you don't obey the laws, then he has to punish or He's not just. They actually see God in the Roman emperor construct. Rather than the builder who builds his universe to run on certain design parameters in disharmony with those are actually out of harmony with the way life is constructed, operate, and you die. And so instead of seeing the creator through Christ restoring, rebuilding, and healing, they see the creator through Christ paying our legal penalty so God doesn't have to execute them. It's a big difference, yes. That, that's what I was going to say. I think, I mean, punishing and the imposed law construct is one part of it. But to me, it's the same as the disciples. It's the misunderstanding of what the kingdom of God is. And it is not, it does not look like kingdoms of this world. That's exactly so right. So the punishing part is one part of it because that's how human governments run. Mm -hmm. But it's the entire government. And it doesn't look anything like the kingdoms that we recognize on this earth. It's the what? same thing disciples were, were fighting about with who's going to sit next to it. Well said. Wendell in the back. In 2 Corinthians 3, the second half of that chapter, Paul describes a veil being before the eyes of the people yeah. when they read, read Moses' teachings. I mean, Moses talked about the, the love of God. He talked about being a friend of God and whatnot. And yet they had a veil before their eyes. And I think the same thing has happened to us. And, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because we're going to get to that actual concept later in the lesson. It's well, exactly right. This veil obstructs. We don't see God for who he is. We see another version, don't we? And what's that veil represent in the old sanctuary system? Remember when the, when the priesthood of believers dressed in their white robes representing us, the, the daily priests in their white robes representing us with our, with our Christ-like character that we've partaken of because Christ developed for They go into the holy place, which represents the church, where they have the, the showbread, the bread of life, so the word. They have the, the lamp, which is the word of God. I mean, they're in there every Sabbath partaking and eating of the bread, and they, and they look to the Shekinah. They want to see God more clearly. Something blocks their view. A veil. There's a veil. And what's sewn on the veil? Angels. Angels. And what, what kind of a being is Lucifer and his minions? Angels. Okay? These are the lies that, that Satan has told about God that veil us. And thus at Christ's death, what happened to that veil? It was torn. Christ destroyed him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. Destroyed him. Opened the veil. The way is open now. We don't have to believe those lies anymore. Well said. A question all the way in the back? Yes. Um, most everyone that uh, these ideas have been been presented to, and I'm taking this from uh, one of the internet comments, um, claim they believe that both views are true, imposed laws at times and natural law also at times. How do you, how do we work with that? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right, and it comes out, there's a great chapter in my new book that actually goes <laughs> through all that, but, uh, but a parent, uh, and this is one of the examples I give, um, a parent has a rule for their child um, not to play out in the street. Does the, the parent ever have rules like that? And if the child breaks the rule and runs out in the street in front of a car, what's the, what's the problem with doing that? You're breaking mom's rules? The laws of physics are going to get broken when the car hits the child, right? Isn't this the real problem? And what's the rule for? So, do you have to tell an adult, don't play in the street? You have to set a rule up for an adult not to do that. Well, you shouldn't if they're actually thinking adult, if they're an intelligent, reasonable adult. Maybe if they're an immature, childlike adult, you might still need that. But in a thinking adult, you don't need it. God, absolutely in love like a parent, used rules. He absolutely did. And you'll read in, in 1 Timothy where it says, the law was not given for the righteous, but for the wicked, for those who do not 
live according to the gospel that was given to Paul, but are slave traders and abusers and mockers and all these other things, a long list of horrible things. The law was given for them, but not for the righteous. This list of rules, we don't need the rule not to play in the street for the mature. So in love, God has given rules to the childlike for what purpose? And the scripture tells us two purposes, why these list of rules were given. One, as a hedge of protection to protect. So we keep the rules, we won't go out in the street, we'll protect until we're grown up enough to understand. And as a diagnostic instrument, Paul says in Romans, I wouldn't have known what sin was if it wasn't for the law. The law points it out. It exposes what's defective in me. It shows me where I am not in harmony with the way God built things. So it's like an MRI of the soul. If you had a cancer in your lung, what's an MRI do for you? It exposes it. Does the MRI fix it? No, there is no cure in the law. There's no cure in the law. The cure is in Jesus Christ. But the law was given to help diagnose and to hedge to protect, to lead us to Christ. So yeah, God used that method, but it's not the remedy, it's not the cure, and it's only a distillation of the design protocols. All those rules are an expression to help keep us in harmony until we're actually healed. Angels in heaven didn't need that list of ten. They didn't have trouble with adultery. They didn't have a mother and father they needed to honor. They didn't have sins passed down to the third and fourth generation. It wasn't there. That list was not in heaven. That list was specially uh, 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 designed or written for a sinful human condition based on the design protocols upon which God built life. Uh, Sunday's lesson. First paragraph. The return from exile in Babylon sparked joy in the hearts of the remnant people, but the return also caused anxiety. Would they be safe and secure in their land, or would enemies come again to, to harass them? Had God forgiven them their past unfaithfulness, or would he continue to uh, their punishment? Let's look at the questions. Would they be safe and secure in their land, or would enemies come to harass them? Is it likely that people had this concern? Sure they did. But who was their primary enemy. Themselves. Well said. What was their greatest threat to their security and safety in the land? Other nations or their own apostasy? Yeah. Why did they end up being taken captivity in the first place? Because they refused to stay faithful. Is there a lesson in this for us today? Do we ever suffer in this world because of doing things our own way and refusing to follow God, God's plan, design, methods in our lives? And in the aftermath, do we live in fear of suffering again? What is the greatest threat to our personal security and peace in the world today? Outside enemies? Ourselves. Ourselves. The greatest battle we have to fight is with self. That's it. Yeah. All right. Yes. Does it follow, though, that if we are following all of those constructs that God designed that everything will be hunky in life? In our character, yes, absolutely. If we follow his design, we will have peace internal to ourselves in the face of the external storms. Christ is our example, sleeping well in the storm. Even when he was being crucified and abused, he maintained his peace. Stephen, when he's being stoned, uh, had the glow of an angel. Father, don't lay this to their account. Um, So yes, internal to ourselves, our character, our heart, our mind will be at peace. But we may, we may be martyred. So that we're Job. saying this is a prosperity gospel where everything's going to just fall into place and you're going to be wealthy and all this just because you follow all those things. No, we're not talking. Notice I said internal to yourself. Right. I said in heart, in mind, in character, you will have growth in peace, in mind, in heart. But no, you may be like Job who suffered the loss of 10 children, all of his wealth, ended up sickness and disease. Uh, physiologically on this earth, he actually suffered greatly, but his, he, he had peace. He, he trusted God through all of that. But he, he, he anguished in the sense of he grieved for the loss of his children. He cried. He was heartbroken. But he didn't distress in the sense of what's wrong with me? I am a sinner. Remember his friends came. You've sinned terribly. You've sinned terribly. No, I haven't. He had peace knowing that he was not at fault for this. So there was grief in the external loss, sadness over what was going on around him, but there wasn't that internal sense of condemnation, shame, guilt, fear that he was failing, fear that he was going to burn in hell, fear that it was all his fault. All that was not, he had peace with himself and peace with God, even though he was still agonizing for what was going on around him. Yes? Well, he thought that was coming from God. And I find it really interesting, though, when he got his audience with God that he had asked for, 
that God never really explains. He explains in Job to us what happened, but he never really talks to Job about really it's Satan's fault. You know, I, I, I let loose, he let loose, you know, and this is the result. He never explains it. All he does is say to Job, trust me. Look at what I am capable of doing. Look at what I've done and see that I am that kind of being so you can trust me. He never does say. But, but he did. This is the point. Job had himself. peace with himself and he still had peace with God even though he didn't understand it all. He didn't doubt that. I'm just saying God never explained why what we, Job would feel like was punishment. Was we, let's, let's rephrase that. We don't have a recording that God explained it to him. We don't know that he didn't explain it to him. We just don't have it recorded that he explained it to him. I have no, I, I personally believe that Job got an explanation at one point. Or at least he figured it out as Abraham did on his way to sacrifice his son in his agony. You don't hear a voice from God explaining it to him, but it, it, we're told that Abraham finally realized, hey, if God gave me this son to first place, he can resurrect him. So Abraham finally figured it out and figured it out based on knowing God. I think Job finally came to an understanding of what was going on. My, that's my personal belief, but it's not recorded, so you're right. It's in Job, so somebody yeah. figured it out. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. it seems like that, um, that when God withdraws his protection, that allows external forces to come in. And with the, the case of Israel, it appears that the reason that God withdrew his protection is because the people wanted him to in the sense that they didn't want to be with God anymore. Absolutely. But in the sense with Job, Job didn't necessarily want God to remove his protection. Correct. So why did it happen? Exactly. Why did it happen? Questions about God's judgment. Because, yes, exactly right. Uh, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, we are a spectacle, a theater to angels and to men. That, that uh, in, in Colossians 1, uh, 20, it says that all things in heaven and in earth are reconciled to Christ and the cross. So he the, like a pawn. Um, I wouldn't say a pawn. I would say he was such a friend of God. And that's what it says in there, um, that he was such a trusted friend of God. And it says right in Job, I think chapter 42 or 41, that Job, you have said of me what is right. This is the deal. Are, are, you a friend of, are you a friend of God knowing, hey, let's say you have a close friend. Let's say your dad, uh, uh, somebody, granddad that you love. Somebody's been falsely accused of something, and they're, and they're being ruined. Their reputation is being ruined in, in the press. They're being, they're being slaughtered. Uh, uh, they're, 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 uh, maybe they're running for president, and they're just, all these lies are being told. And, they're being ruined. and you have the ability to go on the witness stand for them to set the record straight. Would, 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 you, would you be willing to do that? Well, if there was a dialogue and we agreed to the arrangement, but if it's something that happens outside of my knowledge, but 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 Job Job, well, um, my 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 belief in Job was that Job said, "My life's in your hands, Father. Use it as you will. I'm willing to do what you need me to do, Lord. I trust you that much." Yes, and I, I really want to move on. Yes. I just wanted to point out that the, the concept that there was a hedge around Job is a, an accusation by Satan, um, the father of lies. So that protection may not. You know, that hedge may not actually have been a true hedge. He may have, you know, when, when God said he's in your hand, it's the same language that, that, God, that Abraham used talking about Hagar to Sarah. She's in your hand. She's already your servant. You know, she's already in your territory, essentially. Um, and so we can't necessarily assume that what Satan said was true. That's just my point. Yeah, I think the issue was really that Satan was trying to get the universe to dis distrust God. And that God knew, it, it started out right, right in Gen uh, Job 1, God makes a judgment about Job. He's perfect and righteous in all his ways. There's no one on the earth like him. God judges Job's heart and character. Satan says, no, he's not. He's not righteous. He only pretends to be because you pay well. You got this hedge of protection, you pay him well. And, and that's why it pretends. The onlooking universe, the angels watching, can't read hearts and minds. If they could, none of the angels would have been deceived by Satan in the first place. They would have looked through him and said, you're a liar. I can see that right in your heart. They couldn't see it. So now who's telling the truth? How do you know? God says he's righteous. Satan says he's not. How do you know? He's in your hands. You can do with what he want. Now, did God say to Satan, you can only harm him? He says in your hands. Satan could have had him voted president of the world king of the whole world. Everybody come and pay it adoration. Give him a billion more dollars and more wealth and, and all that. I mean, he could have done that. Satan had, remember he offered all the nations of the world to Jesus. He could have done that. He didn't do anything positive for him. Why? Satan's character is now being revealed. He's revealing who? He's the destroyer. Showing it. In action. Satan's un uncovering himself. 
And at the same time, Job eventually says what is right and stays loyal and faithful. And so if Satan gets Job to curse God, he looks to those angels who can't read hearts and minds and says, see, I told you guys, he's wrong about Job and he's wrong about me. You can't trust him. He's lying. This was what was going on. Tuesday's lesson. Zechariah 3, 1 through 8. It says, then, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. Then I said, Put a clean... Then, yeah, then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put the clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place among these standing here. Listen, O high priest Joshua and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. Let's identify the players. Who is Joshua the high priest? Literally, he's the first priest, high priest after the captivity is over. He's the first one. But who does Joshua the high priest symbolize? Uh, he symbolizes, he stands for the people, but what's another name for Joshua? Jesus. Jesus. And who's our high priest? Jesus. Jesus. So he also stands for Jesus. Who's the accuser? Satan. Who's the angel of the Lord? Symbolic. Who's it representing? Jesus. That's exactly right. What is the fire from which the burning stick is plucked? Sin. Deviations from God's design. Deviations from God's design. What, is, what does it mean? What, what, what uh, is the burning stick? Yeah, sinful humankind. Sinful humankind is the burning stick. What do the defiled or filthy clothes represent? Defective human character. Our hearts and minds filled with fear, filled with selfishness, filled with guilt, filled with shame, filled with arrogance, filled with pride. It's our characters represented, uh, built upon all these motives and principles. What does it mean to take away the filthy clothes and put on clean clothes? Transformation, Transformation of character. Removing fear and selfishness from the character and restoring our hearts to self-sacrificial Christ-like love. To be like Christ in character and heart and mind. Who's the branch? Jesus. Jesus is the branch. That's right. So, with all that now, what do you gather of the meaning of this little vision? Condemnation and vindication. <clears throat> Condemnation and vindication. Plan of salvation. God, Plan of salvation. God will re remove the filthy thing from our lives and restore it to us clean. God removed the filthy things and restored the clean. There's so much. This is rich, guys. This is very, very rich. You should mark it in your scripture. It's a great one. Yes. He didn't put clean clothes on top of the dirty. He, oh, he didn't, he didn't cover over the dirty clothes, did he? You know that one? That, that metaphor? That uh, when we accept the, right, the robe of Christ's righteousness, he covers over our wickedness with the robe. So when the Father looks at us, he can't see the wicked filthiness of our character. No, he doesn't do that. And he didn't put someone wearing clean clothes. Yeah, he, didn't, he, he didn't stand up the older brother in between God and the person with the filthy clothes and have the, have the angel of the Lord or God look at the, the healthy brother in his stead. Didn't do that either. That's commonly taught as well. God looks at us. He doesn't see us. He sees Jesus who stands between us and the Father. It's not true. That's all imposed law construct. It's all imposed law construct. So Adam deviated from God's design and humanity was infected with fear and selfishness. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they ran and hid because they were afraid. And fear causes you to watch out for who? Self. That's exactly right. So fear and selfishness fills the heart. Operating on Satan's principles, being burned in that burning fire of sin, dying in the fires of selfishness. Jesus comes and becomes sin, though he knew no sin so that we might become, anybody can finish it? 
the righteousness of God. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. He took upon himself our iniquity. Our iniquity was laid upon him. He took upon himself our sinful condition so that he might cure it and remedy it. He would remove the filthiness and, and, and put on the pure righteousness of Christ. He, thus the angel of the Lord and the high priest both represent Jesus doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Jesus takes away our sinfulness, literally. He destroyed, this is Timothy, he destroyed sin and brought life and immortality to light. He destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light. Jesus Christ actually cleansed the species human by his singular victory. He now holds the cure, the remedy, the keys of salvation and eternal life. Satan is a legalist. He's an imposed law proponent who claims it's not fair that Jesus can't do this. Every sin must be punished, urged to Satan. You cannot do this because sin hasn't been punished. Satan brings up a long list of misdeeds, arguing that everyone must be punished. Jesus says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Talk to the hand. We don't listen to that up here. Just as he did when he went to resurrect Moses. You can't take him. He broke the rule. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Uh, this is like the uh, parable. The parable of the workers in the field. Everybody remember that parable? They go out and they, uh, it goes out the, the morning watch and hires workers, pay them a penny for the day or a dollar for the day, whatever it was in their money. He goes out in the midday, hires some more and says, I'll pay you what's right. And in the late last hour, I'll pay you what's right. And then after the, the work is over, they line them up last first and they all get the penny. They get the penny. They get the penny. And then the ones who've been working all day get their same penny they agreed to work for. And it's not fair. It's not fair. Do you understand why they say it's not fair? Because they, and, and if you feel any sense of, well, it's not. They worked all day and they only got a penny and these guys only worked an hour and they got the same wage. It's not fair. It's because under the imposed law model. But think about it this way. They're all die under the natural law model. They all have the same sickness. And the reward is what? Remedy. And it doesn't matter whether you take that remedy first thing in the morning, you take it at midday, or you take it when there's one hour left before you're dead. You take the remedy, you get the same outcome. You get cured. Exactly. And this because they have the imposed law concept, they miss the whole point. Well, think about this. You're dying of a terminal condition. Do you want to take the remedy early or in the last hour? So those who took it in the morning had a healthier life and were able to work in harmony with the king and their master for the whole day. Those who took it at the end only got cured with very, like the thief on the cross. Took it and didn't have much opportunity to do anything good. Which had the better deal? those who took it early, but they actually thought that they had the worst deal because they had an imposed arbitrary law concept. The idea that, hey, it's arbitrary what we get paid. How much we get paid, it just, I mean, he could pay us $100 instead of a penny. No, it's a, it's a parable. The amount you got paid is the same. And what's the amount? You get cured from sinfulness and you get eternal life. That's the payment. You're restored. And it doesn't matter when in your life you take the remedy, as long as you genuinely take it, you get the same payment. But if you take it when you're 20, you get a life of living in harmony with the master and working for him and much more peace and much more joy. If you take it when you're on your deathbed, well, you still get the remedy. You get a, but you've missed out on so much. Which makes more sense? Imposed law model or natural law model? Natural. It's incredible. Yeah. So Adam deviated from his design. Satan's the legalist. He argues it's not fair. So Satan's not getting anywhere with Jesus in this argument. Uh, it's not fair. Got this long. The Lord rebuke you. We don't listen to that. His allegations don't make any headway in heaven, do they? So then where does he present his arguments? Where does he uh, present his criticisms? Yeah, so Satan turns to mankind with his legal arguments. And begins to fill the minds of men with all kinds of legal ideas about God. Satan fills our minds with accusations. Accusing us of falling short, of committing too many sins, of being too defective for God to love and save, of being unworthy. Satan accuses us to discourage us and convince us we are beyond hope. He fills our minds with lies about God, presenting God as a being who must inflict punishment for sin. But Jesus said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. See, I've taken away, and looks to us, see, I've taken away your sin. 
So if, if, if I'm right and Satan doesn't get any headway with his arguments against God, hey, it's not fair, he did this, he did that. Lord rebuke you, we're not listening. And Satan is actually then turns to you and me and is always, you're no good. You, you've, you've messed up so many times. There's no hope for you. The Lord really can't love you. You're so horrible. If that's where Satan is presenting his arguments now, then to whom is Christ pleading his pleas? Is there any hint in the passage that we just read in Zechariah that Christ is pleading to the Father? No. Who needs Christ pleads? Who needs to be pled with, in other words? Who would be troubled by Satan's allegations? Would Satan's allegations trouble or disturb God? In other words, would God get confused and uncertain and start doubting himself after hearing Satan's allegations? Oh, maybe it's true. Maybe I'm not a good God. <laughs> or would we get troubled by that? We get distraught, upset, and doubt when Satan makes his allegations. So when you hear and read passages that Christ is pleading before God in heaven, that's not saying he's pleading to God in heaven. Before God means before him, as in he is carrying out the Father's will, carrying out what the Father has given him to do, the task. Here's a quote from a little book called Amazing Grace, page 316. Satan knows that those who ask God for pardon and grace will obtain it. Therefore, he presents their sins before them to discourage them. Against those who are trying to obey God, he is constantly seeking occasion for complaint. Even by... Uh, even their best and most acceptable service, he seeks to make appear corrupt. By countless devices, the most subtle and most cruel, he endeavors to secure their condemnation. From whom is Satan seeking to secure our condemnation? If you have an imposed law construct, then you believe he's seeking to get God to condemn us. And we have a friend in court who argues our case so God won't do it because we have a better defense lawyer than he is a prosecuting attorney. You've heard this before, right? No. Remember, we've already got, the Lord rebuke you. We don't listen to that up here. If you have a natural law construct, then you realize we are sick. God has the remedy. He will provide to absolutely everyone who will accept it. It's available. And it works in 100% of the cases of those who take it. So do doctors condemn to death patients they can heal? If a patient comes to the emergency room with an infection from years of IV drug use and the doctor has antibiotics, will the doctor hold court, ask for witnesses, hear accusations of those who want to see the patient die, examine a list of misdeeds, and then make a legal judgment and pronounce the death sentence upon the patient and then execute the patient? Do you understand this is how many present God? Will the doctor examine the patient that comes to the ER? Hear the history of all that is being reported by family. Oh, he's been doing IV drugs since he was 13. He's been sharing needles with people on the street. Uh, he's been in rehab seven times, but he keeps going back. Will, will the doctor hear this history? Will he examine the records, the medical records of the last seven visits to the hospital and all the treatments they've had? Will he examine the records? Yes, no. Absolutely. For what purpose? Will the doctor make a judgment? Yes. Also known as a diagnosis. And after the judgment, the diagnosis, will the doctor then, judging the condition is a terminal condition if not remedied, di uh, prescribe a, a treatment, a remedy. Offer this antibiotic to the patient. Give them remedy. So who must the enemy, Satan, get to condemn the person, the sinner, so that the sinner won't take remedy. Themselves. themselves. Exactly right. The sinner must condemn themselves. The sinner must be tricked by Satan into believing they are beyond healing. They are not worth saving. They are too far gone, no matter what. Thus, they won't take remedy. Here are some Bible texts, and I want you to note these regarding God's attitude and condemnation of sinners. 
The first one, I'm sure everybody knows, John 3, 16 and 17. 17 is key. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Or John 8, 11, the woman caught in adultery throw down, thrown down before Jesus. Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. But I like this one, Romans 8, 31 through 39. Get this. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who's for us? God. Who can be against us? He who did not spare a son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies, meaning, what's it mean? Who sets us right. It's God who sets us right. Who is it that condemns? It's a question. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised in life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. What's also mean? In addition to who? God. To the Father. Keep reading. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sakes we face death all day long. We are, not consi are, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who, do, who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither presence nor future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you hear it? What's God's attitude? Does condemnation come from God? No, no it doesn't. Never. These ideas of God sitting in judgment, holding court, examining list of deeds that have to be punished, this is Satan's view of God. And this is what has taken hold in the church. And this is why people are terrified of going before God. And we're so thankful we have Jesus who stands between us and God to protect us from his anger and wrath. It's all a lie. This is, we, this is why the, the, the Lord hasn't come. He's waiting for a people who know him, who are ready to see him, who aren't afraid of him. So who, to whom is Christ pleading? You and me. Do we ever struggle because we have mistakenly, have you ever in your life struggled because you thought Jesus needed to plead with his Father for you? You ever had that in your life? I did. I remember clearly having that idea. Have we ever struggled with guilt and memories of past failings, thinking that we've messed up so bad we're beyond hope? Who is behind such ideas if you have that come into your mind? If you thought, if that thought enters your mind from this point forward, what's the answer? When you start getting the thought, you're so bad, you messed up so many times, you're no good, you're beyond help, you're a terminal, nothing can help you, the Lord doesn't care about you. If that thought comes into your mind, it's coming from who? Satan. And what's the answer? The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord rebuke you. It's not the truth. Second paragraph states, while Joshua is interceding before God for the people, Satan is bringing accusation against them based on their sinfulness. Where does it say in the text, Joshua is interceding before God for the people? Go to the text. Where does it say that? It's all read in. They come with a preconceived idea that the purpose of the high priest must, must intercede to protect. We take the blood into the most holy place so God won't, won't destroy them and lash out. This is, this is the view they hold. It's all imposed law construct. It doesn't say that anywhere. It's not in there. Who does Joshua represent again? And what is Jesus doing? What did Jesus do for us? What it, did he do and what is he doing? He took, literally, our sinful condition upon himself. Our iniquity was laid upon him. And he removes our iniquity. He destroyed sin in sinful man. He destroys it. He developed a perfect character. He's cleansing the temple of God. Jesus is recreating in his humanity 2,000 years ago. He restored mankind back to perfection. Sinfulness was taken away and perfection was restored. There's a perfect human being because of Jesus Christ. 
third paragraph says, the Lord, the Lord, um, let's say third paragraph, where am I at here? Hmm. Well, regardless. <laughs> yes. You want me to read it? Yes, read that for me. The Lord rejects the accusations, reminding the accuser that in his mercy he already has chosen Joshua. Moreover, his people already have suffered the full measure of divine punishment. Joshua and the remnant people have been snatched as a burning stick from the destructive fire of long captivity in Babylon. So they've suffered the full measurement of what? Divine punishment. Does that encourage you? Think about what that idea says. All right, I'm going to jump on because there's something I really want to get to. Zechariah 4, 1 through 6. Then the angel who talked with me turned and, and, wake, and woke me. As a man wakes from his sleep, he asked, what do you see? I answered, I see a, a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top, seven lights on it with seven channels of light. Also, there are two olive trees. By it, one uh, on the right bowl, other on the left. I asked the angel who uh, talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, don't you... Know what these are? No, my Lord, he replied, so tell me. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. From what's the lampstand constructed? Gold. Solid gold. What does the lampstand and seven bowls represent? Lord, the Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, Psalms 119, 105. The word of God represented by the lampstand? What word is that? The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. I would say it has an application to the Bible, but it has a bigger application to Jesus, who was the word, logos, made flesh. What do the seven lights represent? The uh, oil represents the Holy Spirit. The seven lights of the churches. And it says in verse 10 that there are seven eyes of the Lord. Um, some Bible commentators suggest this means it's God's all-knowing presence. I actually take a different view. What did Jesus say we are to be for him? Light to the world, are we not? So we are to let our high priest, Jesus, work in our hearts, trimming the wick of our lives so that we shine brightly for him. Could the seven lights also called the seven eyes represent those who are Christ's followers, those who are connected to the solid gold lampstand that Christ shines out through. Yes. What is the eye symbolic of? Knowledge, intelligence, awareness. Mm. So I would like to suggest the seven lights represent the people of God who are enlightened and have spiritual insight and intelligence. These are not the believers trapped in darkness and misrepresentations of God, but those who have been filled with the Spirit and have the light of truth shining out from them. The Hebrew lexicon says that the word translated eye actually uh, can mean physical eye, but also can mean showing mental qualities, mental and spiritual faculties, fountain of knowledge. Right. So I'm going to suggest, and if you remember the symbolism of, the, of the, um, uh, the, the sanctuary, every morning and evening the high priest would come in and trim the wicks of the seven lights. That's a symbol. The high priest working in our hearts to trim us so we burn more brightly for him. So, I gotta just jump down. There's so much in the, the branch. Who does the branch represent? There's a, there's a in Zechariah 6, um, says, that tell, tell this, tell him, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here, this is 6, 12, and 13. Here is the man whose name is the branch. He will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule from his throne and he will be a priest on his throne and there will be harmony between the two. Jesus is the branch. Do you notice it doesn't say he leaves heaven? Is there a difference between leaving heaven and branching out from heaven? Mm -hmm. What does a branch do? Literally, what's a branch do? It extends. It extends. And it connects, right? It's still connected to its source, isn't it? So he branches out from heaven. He left heaven and he is the connecting link that connects disconnected mankind who'd been severed by sin from God. He branches out to heaven to reconnect man back to heaven again. He is the connecting link. I was studying this week. I came across an old journal, Signs of the Times, December 12, 1895. 
consider how this was presented so over 100 years ago and if we've lost anything. In the prayer of Christ for his disciples, he said concerning them, the glory which thou gavest me, I give them, that they may be one as we are one, I and them, thou and me, that they may be perfect in one spiritual union, in parentheses, in spiritual union, that the world may know that thou hast sent me. The glory of Christ is his character, and his character is an expression of the law of God. He fulfilled the law in its every specification and gave the world in his life a perfect pattern of what is possible for humanity to attain by cooperation with divinity. In his humanity, Christ was dependent upon the Father even as humanity is now dependent upon God for divine power in attaining unto perfection of character. God's law is an exponent of his character, an expression of his holiness, but viewed by him who has fallen through sin it is a voice of condemnation, a ministration of death. How do we understand that? That sounds horrible, doesn't it? How do we understand that? Do you understand law is imposed or natural? If you look at, the, at this as imposed law, then it condemns you and the ruler must impose penalties. It must condemn you. You must be killed. How about if you view it as the natural design protocols? Law of respiration. And you're now out of harmony with it with your head underwater. Your head's underwater. You're, you've tied 300-pound you've tied weights to your legs and you've jumped in the ocean. You're breaking the law. What does the law of respiration now do for you? It's uncompromising. It has a power over you now. You are out of harmony with it and it condemns you to death. Why? Has it changed? No. What needs to be changed? The law? Or you need to be put back in harmony with the law. It is not in the province of the law to pardon the transgressor, for by the law the knowledge of sin, by the law shall no man be, no flesh be justified. No ray of hope shines forth from the law to the sinner. That's right. When you're tied on the law of respiration, it doesn't offer you any hope, does it? Not at all. But it's not against you either. It's your condition, being underwater with the 300 pound weights against your leg. That's what's against you, not the law. But through Christ, a way of escape has been provided. Our Redeemer came in the flesh to condemn sin in the flesh, to lay hold of the repenting soul with an unyielding grasp, and at the same time to grasp the throne of God, becoming the connecting link between humanity and divinity, between earth and heaven. He is the only refuge of the guilty soul. In searching to know God, man is directed to Christ, who lived out the law of God and manifest to the world the attributes of the Father. In the Son of God, the inexpressible goodness of God is revealed. For in him, mercy and truth met together. Righteousness and peace kissed each other. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Christ, in the flesh, condemning sin in the flesh, was a perfect revelation of God to the world. In answer to his request, show us the Lord, Jesus said, have, have I been with you so, uh, show us the Father, have, have, have I been with you so long, Philip, that you don't know me? He that's seen me has seen the Father. The Lord Jesus is the embodiment of the glory of the Godhead. Now, now get this next section. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Christ. This is what, what Wendell read earlier about the veil. The, God has revealed himself to man. He stopped to take upon him our nature. And in his Son, we see the glory of divine attributes. This next sentence. Those who see not in Christ the divine character are in the shadow of Satan's mi misrepresentation of divinity. They're in the shadow of Satan's view if you don't see the Father in Jesus. The God of this world has blinded the minds of men that they believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine through them. That's the quote that Wendell read earlier. In Christ Jesus is a revelation of the glory of the Godhead. All that human agent can know of God to the saving of the soul is the measure of the knowledge of truth that is in Jesus to which he can attain. For Christ, for Christ is he who represents the Father. There's so much good in here. I'm just really skipping along really fast. The word of God in the creation of man needed no undoing. There was nothing imperfect, nothing incomplete. He spake and it was done. The very dust of the ground which man was formed was pure. The breath of life was, uh, was holy. He was placed in Eden, the garden of God, and its atmosphere was undefiled. 
the fountains and streams of water, all was holy, all was clothed with the spotless purity and unexcelled loveliness and was in harmony with the character of the Father and the Son by whom the worlds were made and in whom life and the life of men exist. What's he saying? Everything was in harmony with their design because they built things to operate in harmony with their own principles of love. This is why all was perfect and in harmony. But in the transgression of man, both the Father and the Son were dishonored, misrepresented. Their methods were no longer seen in the character of man. Instead, selfishness. Man committed sin, and sin is transgression of the law, which is holy, just, and good. Through sin, the temple of God, which he had built for his own indwelling and glory, was reduced to ruin, was fallen, and in decay. What temple would that be? Us. This is us. The, 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 connect the pieces. This goes to this idea of 2,300 years the temple shall be cleansed. Satan beguiled the holy pair to their own destruction and introduced an element of character that was antagonistic to God and their fellow creatures. What element was that? Fear and selfishness. That's exactly right. Survival of the fittest principle. Before the entrance of sin, the hearts of God's children had been filled with love toward their creator and they were in harmony with his will. But upon yielding to the tempter, a warring element began to work in the human agent. A warring element is in us. And uh, there's so much in this. In this there's uh, several paragraphs left. I'm not going to be able to finish. Man, but in the very last paragraph, it says this. And I encourage you to get the notes and read it all. Everyone who should believe in Jesus should, should be recreated to walk in newness of life and, and from the ruins of Satan that Satan has wrought through sin should rise in purity and holiness the fallen temple of the Lord. Man was to be reconstructed to be formed after the image of, God, of Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God. What's the mission? And you, you read this whole article, it's fantastic. But the mission was to heal, rebuild, reconstruct, restore, recreate, renew, cleanse the temple where the Spirit dwells, you and me. And what is Christ waiting for? 2,300 years, the temple shall be cleansed. And because we've opted this, this imposed law construct, we've created this whole legal mechanism inside a little smoke-filled building in heaven where records are being explored and things are being expunged out of the records rather than realizing that he's working in the Spirit temple to cleanse us from selfishness and fear and restore and write the law on the heart and mind as it says in Hebrews 8. I will write my law on their hearts and minds that we will know him and be in union with him and we'll be one as Christ prayed. This is the message. This is why the Lord hasn't come because people aren't ready because they have a false security thinking that all their sins, past, present, and future were laid upon Christ. The legal penalty has been made. They've got pardon stamped next to their book but their hearts are still filled with fear and selfishness. He's waiting to cleanse us. And this is the message that goes forward. And I challenge you guys, share this perspective. Take it out. Help people see the reality and, 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 the, and the beauty of God's character as revealed in the way he has constructed life to operate. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a God of love who built his universe to operate in harmony with your own character of love, the principle of beneficence, the principle of giving. And we do have a defective element in us, Lord. We want that element purged. We ask and open our hearts that Christ will come through his spirit, cleansing, restoring, renewing, writing your law upon the hearts and minds that we will live in harmony, loving you and others more than self. And we ask for, for continued opening of avenues and opportunities to share this message that the world will be lighted with the knowledge of your character that you might come soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen.